page 284. The feelings and the state of the psyche are dependent on the thoughts, as has been explained many times already. Thus it can be said, somewhat poetically, quote, the psyche is colored according to the thoughts. Because by means of his or her thinking, the human being chooses the color, so to speak, which he or she consciously wants for his or her life, or which he or she pathologically forces into being. In other words, it can also be said, quote, whatever the human being intensively thinks about grows in him or her and becomes fact. But something else is involved with this, something deeper, and indeed the fact that the environmental influences and the personal subliminal desires which can arise from uncontrolledness always lie in wait as bad and negative sides in order to penetrate the thoughts and to control them in a form which brings damage. Unfortunately, it is a fact that that which is bad and negative, once it is created, does not simply disappear again. Rather, it stores itself in the overall consciousness block and in the planetary storage banks, from where the human being can consciously or unconscious subconsciously call it up over and over again and allow it to become the motivating power and might and indeed during the course of many reincarnations. Besides, the human being has been exposed through his or her reincarnations over many millennia to the so-called processes of civilization which have furnished him or her with bad, wrong, unhealthy and negative factors which repeatedly have an effect on him or her when he or she consciously and subconsciously reaches their realms and takes up their impulses. Many of these negative factors sanctimoniously exist under a cloak of that which is amoral and are unpredictable and aggressive, whereby they are additionally able to imprint bad and negative sides into the inner nature of the human being when he or she is inattentive and is not aware of them, or he or she consciously lets them penetrate him or her. Hence, the human being must always consciously concern himself or herself with actually forming his or her inner nature into the better self by recognizing, adopting, and realizing the creational impulses which come from the innermost self. The bad and negative can penetrate the human being and overcome him or her at any time if he or she is not constantly consciously heedful and on the lookout. And therefore, it is also the case that every human being also carries the bad and negative in himself or herself to a certain extent. Indeed, in his or her inner nature, which he himself or she herself has imprinted in complete contempt for the opposite impulses of the innermost creational nature. And indeed, no human being should get carried away in the erroneous belief that he or she does not carry this self-created bad part in himself or herself because such a belief would actually amount to an unbelievable presumption. Regardless how, of how nice and loving and how progressive a human being may be, in his or her inner nature, he or she carries characteristics and forms of self-created things which are bad, evil, negative, and negating, even if he or she has evolved so far, so very far and high. Everything can suddenly break free and break through when one does not practice constant watchfulness and does not nurture the constant conscious evolution in every respect with all means of intelligence and reason. It follows from that that the only protection against that which is bad, negative, and negating is total control over the inner nature and with that also over the thought principle if these two factors are formed according to the innermost nature and its high striving impulses which are creational and deliver the fundamental values for the entire evolution in every respect.
If the human being wants to like himself or herself, then he or she must first get to know himself or herself and form his or her inner nature such that it harmonizes with the innermost creational nature, which in fact contains the creational energy from which there is the emission of creational impulses, by means of which the consciousness with its thoughts is indeed able to form the inner nature in accord with the creational natural laws and recommendations. To that end, it is necessary that one gets to know the innermost creational nature, because only thereby can the inner nature, which is created by the human being himself or herself, be created according to universal laws and recommendations. This is not dependent upon a human being's age or profession, or on his or her position in society, or his or her intelligence, because at any time, the innermost creational nature can in fact be fathomed, and its impulse is used to form inner nature, the inner nature. Only intellect and rationality are required for that, and a will created thereby to also do that which is necessary. Indeed, human beings sometimes have difficulty have difficult or even very difficult times with themselves, with their fellow human beings, or simply with the environment in and of itself. They often feel high or low, so that they are jumping with joy one minute, or are in the depths of despair the next. And when they are really low, then they actually feel so miserable and helpless that they want to die. However, None of these moods are ever a reason for not dealing with the life according to one's best ability and capacity and steering it along the right paths and forming the inner nature such that a personality arises which accords with creation and the true human being. To build up one's own inner nature in line with creation nature and to do it progressively as well as neutral, positive, equalized, and to, in fact, also then know this nature and live true to its constitution actually means living. And it is also certain that whoever has built up his or her inner nature with the impulses of the innermost creational nature has caused it to blossom, can love himself or herself in all honesty and deference, without thereby falling into negative, bad states. But connected with that is knowing oneself. Consequently, the effective facts of the newly formed and creationally directed inner nature must therefore first be recognized and accepted before a practical and respectful love can come about for it. However, once this is done, and once the human being is true to himself or herself in this kind and wise, then soon a fundamental harmony grows in him or her, which, along with love, also contains joy, peace, and personal inner freedom. However, if the human being remains separated from him, himself or herself by disregarding his or her inner nature and not forming it such that it conforms with the creational natural laws and recommendations, then he or she separates himself or herself, so to speak, from his or her own life, because as a result of not developing himself or herself higher, he or she distances himself or herself from real life, that is to say, from his or her own real self, which is embodied by the inner nature and from which the factor of the actual personality comes forth. And if, by means of his or her own will, the human being lives apart from his or her real self, apart from the actual inner nature which the human being must himself or herself develop creationally, then in fact one cannot say that in that case the inner self can be positively given full expression. Because with this self, one is truthfully only dealing with a fake self and an ersatz self which the human being himself or herself is responsible for acquiring and which is only imprinted according to that which the short-lived 
non-idolizable ideas create and express, and which also cannot be realized. This unnatural state, which works against the creational natural impulses and laws, can naturally satisfy no human being in the long term. Consequently, he or she inevitably becomes unsatisfied with himself or herself and gets out of alignment in some form which naturally brings him or her inequity and harm. That the human being then soon no longer likes himself or herself is an unavoidable consequence. However, this not liking oneself anymore does not concern the material body, rather it concerns the self-created, unnatural inner nature, that is to say, the inner self. Once the human being goes into her, his or her innermost creational self and forms his or her inner nature, his or her actual self, and thereby also his or her effective personality, according to the impulses of his or her innermost self and the striving urge, then he or she becomes the human being who is really living according to creation, and he or she becomes one with the creational power, which he or she can then utilize because he or she is able to create it in himself or herself. Also connected with knowing oneself and liking oneself is the factor of self-respect, which is likewise very essential for being a human being who actually also deserves this name and who can live a successful life. Self-respect is an important factor which the human being must not do without if he or she wants to stand upright before himself or herself. The roots extend deep into the inner nature and thereby into the fundamental ego. Consequently, self-respect can be connected with the human being's actual identity. The fundamental values of the actual personality and of the real self lie anchored deep in the inner nature if it is correctly built up and developed. But the decisive dignity, which is an important component of self-respect in every human being, also exists therein, always provided that it has been achieved. But dignity can be injured and violated, and the individual is also thereby injured. And if the human being allows it to come to that, either through his or her own conduct or as a result of others, then he or she suffers the worst kind of self-aversion and total helplessness, which quickly leads to self-disdain and to the decay of the personality. Submissiveness also often plays a decisive role in that when the human being injures his or her own dignity or allows it to be injured by others, which is quite especially the case as a result of religious influences, because religions demand submissiveness. But submissiveness is nothing other than an uncontrollable subservience, which extraordinarily often has a fanatical and canine character. Indeed, submissiveness is described as dedication in order to circumscribe and play down the actual truth. But truthly, this word also already has a very bitter ring to it and bitter background, because behind it is hidden everything which is to do with unvalues, of the following dimension, subservience, self-denial, self-disregard, self-disdain, amenableness, devotion, conformity, false shame, servility, a slavish attitude, compliance, flattery, bootlicking, bowing and scraping, self-abasement, kowtowing, canine obedience, and lack of dignity and affected piety, and so forth. In order to be a real human being, and to have a right, healthy way of life, there are many points which must be heeded and followed. For example, number one, in order to be able to rely on one's own self, it must first be cultivated in neutral, positive, equalized form, or at least to the extent that it complies in large part with the innermost creational nature. Number two, once the inner nature, 
the self, is cultivated, this state must become conscious, whereby a high regard for one's own self emerges. Number three. One's personal imagination of a higher evolution than that which is currently the case must always be tended and nurtured, because one's striving towards that which is higher is spurred on thereby. Number four. An affirmation for the purpose of higher development of the personality is as necessary as the affirming of the life itself. Number five. Unsatisfaction must never appear because it moves one to be inactive and to do things which are devolutive and destructive. Unsatisfaction additionally creates uncalm and thereby leads to the restlessness and inconstancy. Number six. Since the human being cannot flee from himself or herself, it is absolutely necessary and important that he or she develops himself or herself and organizes himself or herself for progress towards that which is higher. He or she is only thereby able to realistically live with himself or herself in love, peace, joy, freedom, and harmony. Number seven. If the human being loves himself or herself appropriately, righteously, and evolutively, then he or she is also able to respect himself or herself and his or her ideals, as well as his or her deeds, words, thoughts, feelings, and actions, and so forth. Number eight. If the human being consciously steers his or her life according to his or her innermost creational nature, he or she also loves and respects its results, which are expressed through the inner self and through the actual personality. Number nine, in order to be great in consciousness as well as in one's ideals, thoughts, and feelings, and in one's psyche, the human being must never be submissive. Rather, he or she must be great in his or her inner nature, the actual self. And number 10, friendliness, which is exercised, and the spreading of love, peace, freedom, and harmony lead to progress and success, and indeed, both with oneself as well as with other human beings.